Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you on this very special evening. Uh, we have uh, the topic of um, a masterclass in meditation, and the two speakers who I'd like to invite to come up on the stage now while I give their brief introduction, uh, Gopi Patel and Yogesh Sharda. Uh, they actually are very, very similar. They come from different families. They were both born in Africa, and uh, their families are both all in our knowledge, as we call it. And um, Gopi uh, was introduced to meditation around the age of two, and Yogesh was about eight. So between them, I worked out that they have over 60 years of experience in meditation. So uh, they're both widely traveled. They do a lot of uh, seminars and uh, retreats around the world. And Gopi is particularly interested in conflict resolution. And I know that Yogesh also does a lot of work with businesses and meditation and self-development. So they both have a wonderful sense of humor and a lot of wit. And I know that you're going to enjoy this evening very much. Thank you both. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So just a short intro for myself. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation and the welcome. I used to live in the UK years ago, but for the last 16 years or so, I've been based in Istanbul, in Turkey, and taking care of our services there. <laughs> And from there also traveling around to different places. And uh, as she was mentioning that meditation has been something that's been part of my life since I was quite young. And uh, for those who do meditation, you'll also know that uh, you get to know your mind very well. And your mind entertains you very well. And so tonight um, we'll be sharing some of those ideas about the experiences on the journey, what works and what maybe didn't work so well. Uh, some chat from us, but also we'd like to do some meditation exercises with you to go into the experiences of uh, deeper meditation. And uh, Gopi's been a friend for about 20 years or so. And um, I'll ask her to share something now. <laughs> Thanks, Yogesh. Um, I have to say, when we were preparing for this talk, I found it quite difficult. The, the word masterclass in meditation um, implies that it, somebody needs to have probably done a basic introductory in meditation first. So I'm just wanting to ask, who here already has a meditation practice of some kind? Can you raise your hand? Okay. All right. Thank you. And who here doesn't? It's completely new to meditation. Okay, so we've got a mixed group. So <clears throat> let's see what happens this evening. Um, as Yogesh said, I, I've been on a path of meditation, even though I wouldn't have called that meditation from a fairly young age. And keeping alive an eternal space whilst living in this world, has been quite an interesting journey um, for the last 40 years. So, um, <coughs> probably for me, the best place to start is to do what we do best, is let's meditate. Is that okay? Yeah. So, throughout this evening, there will be a series of meditations that will take form. So just follow the meditations because the meditation is the technique, for those of you who are looking for methods or whatever, it is the process. So I'll start off, we'll both lead the meditation and you'll, you'll figure out how, but I'll share a commentary to guide us in. One of the first places to begin always is a physical preparation, <coughs> you know, that you're sitting up straight. Um, any slouchiness of the spine and it's been proven that you will definitely fall into a deep slumber at some point, especially at the end of a long day. So sitting up erect, freeze up, 
um, the body to be able to breathe normally. And also scientifically, it's been proven that you concentrate better with your eyes open. Now, for many of you, this might be commonplace. For some, it might be a new experience. Um, I'll invite you to experiment as you wish. If it's uncomfortable, you can close your eyes. Otherwise, uh, for most of the duration, you can leave your eyes open and rested on the floor. Just give them a place to rest. Okay. All right, we're going to start with a, a very simple relaxation. Respecting the energy of the body is very important so that it can allow um, the spiritual energy to be released. So I'm just going to ask you to just begin by um, tightening all the muscles in your feet and your legs. So your calf muscles, your thigh muscles, as tight as you can and relax. And again, and relax. And now the muscles in your stomach and chest, as tight, pull your stomach in, squeeze your chest, and relax. And again, and relax. And now the muscles in your shoulders, arms, hands, you can clench your fists, you can shrug your shoulders. We hold a lot of tension up here and relax. And again, and relax. And now, with your eyes closed or resting in the front, take a couple of deep breaths in through your nose. Hold it and slowly exhale through your mouth. And just allow the tension of the day to be released from the body. This body has done a lot for you today. And again, breathe in through your nose, hold the breath and slowly exhale and just feel any knots of tension dissolving and become aware of the gentle rhythm of your breathing in and out and this brings your attention into the now, in this room, sitting on this chair, calm, present, ready to begin the journey inward. And to continue that journey, so I ask myself the question, who am I? I know that in daily life, I play many different roles. I carry various labels and I also wear many different masks. But for a few moments I want to step back from all of that and ask myself, who am I behind the mask? When I drop the labels, who am I? And I use my thought power to draw my energy away 
from my feet, from my legs, and away from my hands and my arms. I draw the energy of the body up through the stomach and the chest, up through the neck, and to my face. And all that energy, it focuses at the center of my forehead. This is the place known as the third eye, the immortal throne of the soul. And I become aware of the soul energy. in the center of my forehead. And this soul energy, this is me. This is I. physical, spiritual energy. I am eternal. Deep within, I, the eternal soul, there is a reservoir of inner peace. And this peace has always been inside me. I choose to re-emerge this peace. And all I have to do is just be aware. Be aware, I am peace, I am eternal, I am living light. The peaceful soul that makes this body function. And as I do so, the mind becomes quiet. Just be with this feeling of peace, 
in your mind for one minute. And now gently, I return to the awareness of this room here. For a few moments, imagine you've just been born again. Yeah. And this energy that we've just created, the energy of soul consciousness, the act of meditation is keeping this energy alive. It's very simple. I was very fortunate on my journey when my first very deep experience of the peace and the joy and the bliss and the connection associated with meditation happened when I was eight years old. And I've come to understand the journey of meditation rather differently because I started from a young age. So often, um, you know, when you think about how a baby is born, there's such a pure energy and a pure expression of energy. And when the baby's born, it can't even say mum and dad, but it recognizes energy of benevolence. It recognizes love, it moves towards love. The baby, when it's born, doesn't ask for a road map of life. Somebody tell me where I'm going. Or somebody tell me what are the signposts on the way. But the energy of that purity from childhood, it's a very trusting energy, it just lives in the moment. And then as pieces of information come, it grows, it adapts, it uh, begins to make sense of its surroundings, and then it begins to give a form to something. And that's how I began my journey, is follow this feeling. Don't think too much. Because there's so many questions around it. How do I know I'm meditating properly? What's the exact method of meditation? What are the signs along the journey? How do I know I'm doing it right? <laughs> and these are just interruptions in a flow that's quietly there, that's existing. It's like looking after a, new, new, looking after a newborn baby. So when you've just been born and you've got this energy, then the question is, 
What am I going to do to sustain it and cultivate it? And that's forward momentum on the path of meditation. It's very much about keeping the experience of the soul alive. So that I move from the paradigm of being a human, occasionally feeling, yeah, there's a soul somewhere, and maybe an experience of peace somewhere, into actually, I'm a being that's living through a transient human experience. And there's a core of stability inside me um, that's supporting me. So I'm deliberately beginning from this place because it's not a place of thinking. It is not a technique. It is not a method that we begin with. We begin with a pure energy that then as you sustain and you cultivate, you watch how it takes shape and form in your life. You watch what it is making you become. And within Raj Yoga Meditation, of which we're both practitioners, very simple. It's about knowing, accepting, and becoming. In Hindi, they rhyme. Um, knowing, Janna, accepting, which is manna, which also means to believe, accept, experience, and banna. So janna, manna, banna, for those who know Hindi. But in English, it's knowing, accepting, becoming. So as I've kind of come forward on this journey of soul consciousness, which is the premise of Raj Yoga Meditation. You know, there's lots of people out in the world that believe in a soul. There's very few that know they are souls. And even fewer that live as a soul amongst souls. So what I'm hoping we do this evening is move in the direction of living um, through what we share and what we're going to experience as well. Choosing a lifestyle, building a lifestyle around soul consciousness is something we're going to take up um, later on this evening as well. But very much for me, the practice of meditation has been directly connected to keeping this energy alive. So that my day is not how many times I was able to connect with this energy, but maybe how many times I dropped. <laughs> I let myself go from there. So my sense of self is very much um, centered in the awareness of being the soul. And that is very, very important as a foundation. I know that on my personal journey, um, I've been taught and I've come to understand there are two energies I have to look after in me on a path of meditation and a practice of meditation. One is the mind and the other is the intellect. And they both need to be good friends. We've had a lot of good experiences in our life, and on the basis of those experiences, maybe we've built certain belief systems. Sometimes you don't know why you do something. Oh, it's just believe in it. It feels good. And then later on, when you get challenged and tested, you've got to think, well, why am I doing this? And so there's something about the balance of meaning with experience um, that brings a rock-solid sense of confidence in the self. I know who I am, um, and I know why I'm doing something. And that's very important. The practice I was taught very early on, when I was eight years old, began with you know, an elder daddy, one of our elder teachers of the university. I was eight years old, sitting down with my brothers and sisters, and she said, okay, 
first thing you've got to learn how to discipline the mind, look after the mind. It's a, it's a toy. Do you like playing with toys? Do you like playing with dolls? And, and then she gave us a practice because it's the intellect that is the disciplining factor for the mind. The mind by itself is a child. And she said, you need to give your intellect a direction. And she gave us four questions. Who am I? Who do I belong to? Where do I come from and why am I here? Like major questions for an eight-year-old. <laughs> but somehow, in a child's body, you're actually attuned. You're still fairly, your energy is still fairly pure and uncorrupted. I'm not sure about an eight-year-old today, but definitely those years ago. And I had an awareness of some of the knowledge of Raj Yoga. And when I went and sat down and I just began this dialogue, and she said, you've got to have this dialogue with yourself, and if your mind wants, you've got to do it three times, in a, in a loop of three times. And if your mind wanders off in between, you've got to go back to question one and start again. Okay. And so that was my methodology and a compass resetting so I could always come back to this experience of the self. No matter where I've been in life, what I've gone to, who I've been connected with, so that I can always have a sense of feeling grounded in myself and not get carried away by the influences of the person I'm with, the place I'm at, what I'm doing, etc. So, this, I just want to say a little bit more before I move on about the subject of the mind. Yes, it's important, but I also feel it's given too much importance. <laughs> because the most important energy is the energy of the soul that I am. The mind by itself is nothing. It is a function. It's like a spark from the consciousness of the soul. The moment the soul inhabits the body, um, something gets activated. It's a bit like a current of energy hits the filament, you get light. And so the soul and the energy of the soul is a living energy. It's a, it's a current of energy, it is a light. And when it gets activated within the body, you think, a thought. Thought energy is mind energy. But it is just the energy of the soul. And when I remember I am the soul, then I'm not controlled by my mind. Because my mind is my child. And that's very, very important as a basis in Raj Yoga meditation. When I forget I am the soul, it's like a mother forgetting she's the mother and having a kid running around her like crazy and she's totally forgotten she's the mother of that kid feeling completely helpless, mind's going in 10 different directions and doesn't know what to do. And so very, very important, this awareness that when I come back to being, I know who I am, I am the soul. Yes, the mind will play its games and later on we're going to go into what is it that makes the mind wonder, why is it that we experience the mind to be another self, almost, living with ourselves, right? There's a terminology out there, they call it the egoic mind, it's got a life of its own. And so we're going to talk about what creates that and what are some of the practices that will help us um, manage and dissolve mental distress as well. And then, you know, more than anything, for me, um, when you're looking after a newborn baby in this new energy, um, you have to stop taking in bad food. So part of the meditation process is not just becoming something, but within becoming something, it's shedding something. Just letting go what is not useful for me. Which means sometimes apply a full stop to something. Enough is enough. And so looking after the self progressively, and you get to know on the journey hang on a second, this is what it really feels like to be me. And then when I'm engaging or thinking in this way, this doesn't feel like me, okay, drop it. Don't be tempted to go down that road. So I'm starting from this place because I want to keep this simple. 
um, it, the journey of meditation, and especially the journey of soul consciousness, is a beautiful journey. And it's a journey about coming home. And every one of us want to come home. To come home to that very deepest part of ourselves that's peaceful, that's pure, and that's divine. So I'm just going to pause here and invite you into a moment of silence <coughs> to just go back in and reconnect with that core. So it was asked earlier that um, how many people are not meditators, how many are new, and also it was asked how many people do meditation, and the majority put their hands up for those who do meditation, but how many here are meditators, as opposed to how many do meditation? people slowly admitting to that. <clears throat> so what's the difference? I think many people do meditation as a, a way to de-stress, to feel calm, to deal with the challenges of life. But for me to be a meditator is something more. That means it's a lifestyle. And that means as you go through the day, you're paying attention to the kinds of thoughts that you're producing. And you're checking yourself, am I thinking uselessly? Am I thinking too much? Is concern changing into worry? Am I holding on to useless thoughts from the past? And so it's like there's a heightened awareness whereby you're naturally checking what your mind is doing. And the reason is because meditators understand that uh, the greatest energy that we have is our thought power. And also that the way one spends one's thought power is the basis of the entire human life experience. And for me it's a bit like uh, an athlete who wants to, to win a race, wants to win the gold medal. Now such a person will pay attention to what she or he eats and what time they eat and how many calories and so on. And in the same way I think people who are meditators are mental athletes. That they have this natural checking going on through the day. And um, it's also a return journey. And I like to use the idea of, uh, you know, of smartphones and how science and technology is always upgrading itself. If I ask how many people here have a smartphone, I think pretty much everybody. And since science and technology is always upgrading, then a question does arise that uh, can you also become a better version of yourself? Consider this, what would you be like a version 2.0? I think, you know, we would say perhaps, well, I'd have a, a more stable mind, I'd have greater self-respect, my happiness would be deeper and would be my own, uh, my ability to love and to forgive maybe would be higher. And uh, why 
you know, why we may like to be like that, it's because I believe the journey of meditation is a return journey back to what we call as true self or authentic self. And uh, just like Gopi, you know, I was around eight, nine years old when I started doing meditation, going to the, the center in the east part of London. And I remember in those days, uh, I would just sit and um, concentrate and just go off. <laughs> no, no problem. And uh, I would wonder what all the adults in the room were talking about when they would say, I have waste thoughts, I can't concentrate. I would think, well, you know, what's wrong with them? Isn't it easy? Of course at that age, uh, there are not so many pulls on the mind, not so many demands. And it was a bit later that I understood that, okay, there is a need for, you know, some kind of, uh, let's say, methodology in order to being a life, in addition to being a lifestyle, but also I need to know how to think. You know, what should I think about when I'm doing meditation? And um, one of the things I've become aware of over the years is that sometimes we try to do meditation too quickly without having developed proper concentration. It's before meditation comes concentration. And if the concentration power is weak, then in meditation we just wander. You know, our mind just taxis around on the runway and we never actually take off. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yes? Is that, that's a yes, is it? Yes. All right. Okay. I, I suspected that was the case. Uh, but we also understand why. And that is because uh, the mind races, the mind produces waste thoughts due to the effect of my past actions. And uh, I don't just mean past actions of previous lives, but past actions even of one day to day. My karma impacts my consciousness. My actions impact my consciousness. If, for example, on a day uh, you have spoken a lot of useless things, or even you've spoken good things but too much, if you've thought unnecessary things, if you've had waste thoughts, then the effect of that is the intellect gets burdened. And it's a slogan I heard many years ago, waste creates weight upon the intellect. And then when you try to meditate, either you fall asleep or uh, you just spend time, you know, battling with waste thoughts. And so there is the importance that through the day I need to pay attention to checking the quality of my consciousness, and my thoughts, and therefore also attention on the number of words I speak, how much I speak and how useful that is. So how do you develop concentration? Well, there are concentration exercises to do. And uh, let's have a look at the mechanics behind concentration. Let me give you an example that let's say, let's say I ask you to sit in a, a comfortable armchair and I ask you to watch your favorite movie for two hours. And I say, just watch this movie, but don't move around much. Could you do it? Yeah, it's your favorite movie, remember? So two hours, not a huge issue. And then we take a second scenario. I said, okay, sit in the same chair, two hours, don't move around much. Look at the same television. This time the TV is off. Could you do it this time? Hmm? More difficult at least, right? Maybe you could, but more difficult. So then the question is, what's the difference between the first scenario and the second scenario? How come you were able to be more concentrated the first time 
And one would say, well, there was something to entertain the mind. But then the further question arises that when you are watching the film, uh, where actually is the film happening? Is it happening on the screen? Or is it actually happening in your mind? The screen is not a living thing. It's giving out, the screen is giving out some images and some sounds. And those images and sounds are stimulating thoughts, ideas and emotions in my own mind. And if you enjoy that, enjoy that experience, then the concentration is natural. And sometimes a film takes you, you know, through a roller coaster of emotions. There is terror and fear and joy and excitement. And then we say, oh, that was a great film. Yeah. Right? It means it's stimulated a lot of thoughts and emotions. And in a way, that's what we do in meditation, but without, um, without ultimately the need for external stimuli. Initially, we may use music. You know, we may use a meditation commentary like we have been doing. But as one becomes an experienced meditator, then we use spiritual knowledge, which we call as eternal truth, uh, basically what we are studying here. And then we use that to guide our thoughts. And as our concentration improves, you find that the thoughts that you are choosing begin to form an alignment. And that's what leads to an experience. The most common complaint people make when they want to meditate is, you know, I can concentrate for like two seconds, then I start thinking about the dog and the house and the traffic and things I have to do. But what helps concentration to develop? And in my experience, there's two things, two pillars, which help concentration. And uh, one of those is visualization. As it is said, you know, a, a, a picture tells um, the story of a thousand words. And of course, some people are more visual, some are less visual. But uh, I like to use myself the visual image of the star of light, which is the most simple and basic one we use. So holding that image, the visual image, helps to collect, bring together the thought energy. And the second pillar, which is the partner of visualization, is contemplation. And that's what we call as a meditation commentary. Choosing certain thoughts and just allowing myself to think over them. These two things together we use here, visualization and contemplation, they help to create the state of concentration. And where there's concentration, then we move into experience, and that we call as meditation. Gobi mentioned earlier the mind and the intellect, the two main faculties of the soul, faculties of our consciousness. And what's happening when we concentrate is that uh, these two are together. Consider, for example, when you were at school, which subjects was it easy to concentrate on? Maths for anyone? Anyone concentrate on math? Because you like maths. Right? In history, anyone? Because you like history. Physics, anyone? Physics doesn't get a good score usually. Um, how about how about lunchtime? Anybody <laughs> like lunchtime? But when there is interest and enjoyment, their concentration is natural. Where there isn't interest and enjoyment, that's when you look at your watch. You look out the window, you wonder how much longer to go before the lesson ends. So it's rather like the mind is what I feel like doing, the intellect is what I should do. 
And when there is a mismatch between these two, then there is poor concentration. Rather like if you have an exam tomorrow, let's say you have a presentation tomorrow, your intellect is saying, I need to concentrate, I need to study, I need to revise. But the mind may be feeling, this is so boring, I just, I want to do something else. You know, I just, I just can't focus, so there's a mismatch. But when what you want to do, uh, what you want to do and what you should do, when they come together, then that's concentration. The mind and intellect are working in partnership. And the result of that is then absorption. It goes into you, it becomes an experience. And that's why uh, in this Raja Yoga meditation, which we study here, uh, we spend quite a bit of time in uh, studying the spiritual knowledge. Knowledge has to be used in order to guide and direct the meditation. Sometimes we use the example of the wild horse. In the mind is a wild horse, as it has been said in some, uh, some traditions. It runs and it runs aimlessly. But the horse has to be directed. And so I, I found uh, five, let's say five steps helped in knowing what to do in order to keep myself moving forward in meditation. And uh, the first one is the simple one we tried earlier where you just withdraw. I withdraw my attention from whatever is happening around me. And of course it's important to minimize distractions. If there is something you need to do, don't think I will do this after meditation because it will <laughs> pull the mind. You need to do it and finish it so the mind is, is free. Also, don't meditate with your smartphone next to you. Otherwise, that's going to pull. So withdrawal means to minimize the, the distractions and to really take my attention away from the outside to the inside. Rather like whenever you do something important, now you want to give full concentration to it. But then what to do? The next stage is the mind has to be directed. It's not a question of waiting for peace to visit me. I need to direct the mind and that's the second stage which we may call as to affirm. So using spiritual knowledge to talk to the horse, okay horse, let's go this way. And we can use points like we have already used, I am light, I am peaceful energy, I am eternal. One can take different themes in different meditations. And so as we affirm, the mind starts moving in the direction which we want to take it into. And gradually, we reach the third stage which you call as focus. So even at the affirm stage, other thoughts will come to the mind. You, know, you think about responsibilities you have, you think about something that happened in the office, you think about, I need to get home at a certain time. So these waste thoughts will come to disturb the mind. But as you keep moving forward with the affirmation, it's like you move through the layer of waste thoughts and you begin to reach a point of focus. The energy is coming together. And then you reach step four, which is the important step of concentration. And concentration is, is not a thoughtless stage. Yeah. The mind thinks, so there's always going to produce thoughts, but it's rather like you may have one very powerful thought and you're in the experience of that thought. And when you do that, then other thoughts don't arise. Rather like when you're drinking a glass of water. At that time you can't speak. Yeah. Mouth is occupied. <laughs> the same way when one is experiencing the, the, the beauty, the, the joy of 
for example, the peace of the soul, at that time other thoughts don't come. So step four of concentration leads to step five, which is called meditation or experience. The deepest needs that the soul has is really to experience uh, its love for itself, its, its own peace of mind, and the, the pure quality of joy which is within every single human soul. And when the heart is filled with these experiences, when the heart is full, then the mind becomes quiet. And when the mind is quiet, then the intellect becomes clear and we're able to think well. So rather than battling with the mind, more important to fill the heart, release from the heart these pure qualities of peace, love and joy, and then see the end result is clear thinking. Let's take another pause for a moment before we go further. <clears throat> so let's just be quiet together. And you may just like to be with any thought that, that has uh, interested you so far this evening. And just spend a moment just to be with that thought. Is there a slow picture building here for you? Right, we're going slowly here. Yeah. Um, because this isn't a, a kind of a DIY job overnight. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering actually, um, Yogesh, that it's been like almost maybe over 35 years for you. You've grown up with this energy of meditation. Have you ever found meditation boring? And, or, you know, in, in relation to the self? Because most people want to meditate, but occasionally maybe. Right, every single day? Who does it every single day here? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, so there's a few in this. <laughs> okay. And sometimes you leave the self to last. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, this wonderful energy that you've described and clearly you've done a lot of work in directing this energy in a constructive way. How have you kept, what have you done with this question, who am I whilst growing up? Because you've gone from a child to a teenager, to an adolescent, to a young adult, to a full grown adult and the sense of I isn't always peaceful and stable and centered. So how have you sustained that? growing up through these phases of life? Yeah, I think the first thing is uh, the premise for me is uh, I am a peaceful so I believe that. And I believe uh, joy is my religion. And I believe that um, love is the fabric of the soul. And I think because I, I accepted that and believed it very early on, so when I don't feel that, uh, I know I'm, I have, you know, I'm just kind of being influenced by the games of the mind, which I mustn't take too seriously. I remember somebody said to me once, don't take your emotions too seriously. Mm. You know, which means that um, 
You may not be feeling so good one day, you may be feeling upset, but don't lose your self-respect because of that. So for me there's a difference like between saying, for example, I am angry and I'm feeling angry at the moment. Mm. So I kind of distance myself from that emotion and I say, okay, here is me and here's the emotion, hello, how are you doing? You know, rather than, you know, I am that. So that's helped in terms of maintaining self-respect, identifying with what I would call as eternal truth, mm. rather than with a, 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 the temporary machinations of the mind. Mm. So there's one thing, and um, the other thing is, you know, as you, as we all know, as you go through life, especially as you're going through your teenage years and early twenties, you're looking for identity. You're trying to work out, who am I, how do I fit in? And also, there is the, the tendency to try to prove oneself to others. You know, these are quite powerful things mm. uh, in society, trying to, you know, I am also mm. a somebody. And uh, as a result of that also, naturally you compare yourself with others, mm. you, know, you compete with others, mm. And these are all very uh, stress-generating behaviors, <laughs> which really cause a lot of tiredness of the mind. Mm. And I remember once um, I was like comparing myself with some person and then somebody else and somebody else, and I just got fed up. I thought, how many people am I going to compare myself with? <laughs> and it's the mind, the mind likes to do that. And then, um, you know, the question came that, uh, who am I behind all of this? You know, that I have all of these, you know, these masks, these sort of, what we call as the physical identity. Mm. And um, basically the soul has become very attached to its physical identity, which means the culture, the gender, the age, the race, nationality, religion, all the profession, all that is the physical identity. The soul has become attached to that. And this is the main problem. This attachment has to be broken. You know, so I, I worked on that. I really tried to see myself as the soul energy and to stop valuing myself on the basis of my physical identity. Mm -hmm. And that helped a lot to create um, what we may call as emotional stability and self-respect. Mm -hmm. you know. So what does that look like in practice? Like, what does that look like as a thought? Well, it means that, um, you know, let's say you're praised or you're criticized. Mm. Usually if you're praised, you feel great. If mm -hmm. you're criticized, you, you, know, you don't feel so great or you mm. want to criticize back. Uh, but then the feeling was that if somebody praises, thank you, I know, I'm happy, happy for you enjoyed something and it's very nice of you to, to say that. If somebody criticizes, thanks for that, you know, I'll check it out, I'll check myself. So there's a listening, <coughs> but not sort of being shaken by either the praise or the criticism. So the, the emotions don't get triggered when you remain in this space of self-respect. Also, when you do something and it goes well, or it doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like, you see, okay, this is, this, I have something to learn here. Like, this is what I can do better next time. But internally, you maintain your peace of mind and your happiness. And this is one of the slogans or mottos that I became aware of, that no matter what happens, my peace of mind and my happiness is my property, uh, non-negotiable. Mm. Yeah. And it's almost kind of like a, I don't know if it's the right word, but a sort of positive stubbornness that I'm going to keep my peace of mind and my happiness regardless of situation, circumstances. And, and I think that's an act of self-respect. Um, you know, okay, I can understand the whole aspect of um, stepping away from uh, things that are happening in your drama, be it insult or praise or defamation or, you know, you're, you, you, you're doing great at something, not great at something else. But what about some of the deep-seated um, emotions that we don't have a reason for their existence sometimes, like fear? 
or um, worry, you know, which is actually a habit. Um, how have you dealt with those on your journey? Yeah, I think there are reasons for them. I think because uh, in our, as you know, in our study, uh, fear and worry are not the original qualities of the soul. Uh, and in fact, all these emotions are um, what we say is ego-based. Mm. You know? So when they do come up in some form, then uh, what I do is rather than sort of deal with the fear or the worry, I go towards the truth. You know, I remind myself of truth. Who am I? You know, I'm the soul. What is my true nature? What are my real qualities? And when I do that, then it's like uh, the fear and the worry tends to dissolve or lose its energy. You know, as has been said that uh, don't curse the darkness, but just turn on the light. Mm. I believe that, you know, in, whenever anyone is uh, upset, any kind of negative emotion, then it's just that at that moment I have I've forgotten the truth. You know, I've forgotten the big picture of life and I've forgotten who I am. And so um, another practice I used to do, still do sometimes when it happens, if I don't feel so good about something, I just go and look in the mirror and say, wake up please. <laughs> you know? Is wake up to the the big picture of life, wake mm. up to the, the principles of spirituality, wake up to the fact that your peace of mind and your happiness is your possession. And, um, and I kind of smiled and I think, gosh, you know, I was worrying so much about something and it's so needless. Mm. And when the mind becomes settled, then you realize even the thing you're worrying about actually is not a big deal. Mm. I think there's something in that because um, you know, as you're speaking, it's, it's really coming to light that the human experience that we're so caught up in every day is just a transient experience, right? And it's normal. There are aspects within that human experience that we will feel, be it comparing, criticizing, feeling insecure, but they're transient feelings. And that if I'm able to maintain a practice of staying true to myself, then I can move through um, those transient feelings and let them go rather than hold on to them and say, well, I'm really, really scared and my life ends here now. I can't do anything else because the emotion just paralyzes um, the individual into a state of non-activity. And it is, I mean, I, I was just remembering a story as you were speaking um, about 10 years ago, uh, no more actually, 15 years ago, I used to live at the retreat center in Oxford for those of you who haven't been, it's a lovely place to visit. And working in a team of about 30 people, and we were overseeing a big project of which I was partnering with somebody in managing. And my partner um, uh, made a big mistake, and it was going to cost the team time, energy, money to fix it. We were going to go past our deadline. And so it was my job to find out what went wrong. And I remember walking into the office and meeting this person. And you know how it is when somebody close to you and you think, I didn't say anything verbally, but inside you think, why'd you do that? You should have known better. And in that moment, um, I kept my cool externally, but internally there was just one thought. Now I should have known how powerful the thoughts of a meditator are. Because the moment I verbally just asked, you know, the person, I said, so what actually went wrong? I shouldn't have been surprised in the reaction I got back, which was a pushback. You know, who are you to ask me about this? Da, 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 da. And very quickly I realized, okay, this isn't going to go anywhere. So let's leave the office. And as I was leaving the office, um, I was kind of walking out, but I was still a bit bugged by my thought that started about, why did he do that? And then his response back to me. And I could basically see what the games the ego was playing. But you know, you're right, you've got to get to the bottom of this. And as I was walking down the corridor, lo and behold, I come to a telephone. So I think, okay, take two. If we can't do this face to face, I'll do it through a telephone. So I pick up the phone. I pick up the phone and I try again. I says, okay, so 
we just need to get to the bottom of this, let's just do this properly and, you know, what happened, just explain and let's see how we can make the best of a worse of a situation gone bad. And the person just exploded on the end of the phone, right? And so when they exploded, you know, and, you know, there's kind of a lot of explosion coming out the end of the phone and then they hang up on me. And at that moment, my ego just went, poof, and went, nobody hangs up on me. Who does he think he is? <laughs> right? So there's this dialogue going on. Who does he think he is? And there's every part of me that wants to walk back into the office and give him a piece of my mind. And I thought, whoa, whoa, hang on a second. You can't do that. Because if you do that, you can't take back everything you've said. So I thought, no, I can't do that. What do I do? I need a glass of water. I walk straight to the kitchen, drinking a glass of water. Somebody comes in and goes, go pee. You look like you need the meditation room. Oh, yes, why didn't I think of that? Because <laughs> remember, that's the last thing that comes when you know, an emotion gets ignited. So I walked into the meditation room, which has you know, this lovely picture um, of light, what we term the supreme. And I'm sitting there, and it's like World War III begins. right? So there's one side, which is scene replay. And he said this, and how dare he say that? And he was the one who was wrong in this. And then my whole meditation practice of years kicking in, I'm a peaceful soul, I'm a sweet soul. No, but how dare he speak to me like this? And why did he say that? I'm a very, very peaceful soul. I'm a, I'm a sweet, sweet soul. No, but how dare he do that to me? And so that went on for about a good 10 minutes. And I'm sitting in that room, and I'm watching this happen inside. And as it's happening... At some point, and I just let it happen. You know, you don't fight that process. You just let it happen. Be with it. Let it happen. And after about 10 minutes, I arrived at a place where I just, you know, surrendered to an energy bigger than me and just said, what's most important here? Is it that I'm right? Or is it that the love and the friendship is kept in this relationship? And I didn't even have to answer the question, but in that moment, all my tension and battle dissolved in a flash. And that was a major realization for me because ego keeps alive distress and anger. It does. And the moment that's released or the need for the ego to be fed is released and I return back to who I am, it vanishes. The emotion just disappears, evaporates like that. It's not a process. It's a switch. So I sat there and I just surrendered to the love, you know, I just said yes. And I just surrendered to this, you know, energy from above, inside me. I sat there in bliss for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, I get up, go to the door of the room and guess who's standing in front of me? Him. <laughs> and, you know, he's actually come to apologize. And that's very rare for a person like that, you know, because they, you know, it's very difficult to say, oh, go pee, I'm sorry. And I could actually say, you know what, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Sometimes we say it doesn't matter, but it actually does matter because I haven't let go. And what I realized through this episode is that you do need um, a basic practice of having nourished yourself over a period of time. Like I know, I wouldn't have been able to overcome that test had I not had a practice of regular meditation i.e. waking up in the morning, spending time with myself. You know, we spend 45 minutes in the morning when we wake up. We wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm not saying that's what you have to do, but the fact is I spend time investing in the energy of that pure baby that we experienced at the beginning, that real pure feeling of the self. So it's always a reference point there that's solid, and it will not let you go. It will not let you go. And you have to trust that. You know, and that yes, the transient human experience is very strong and feels very strong sometimes, but it's not powerful. Because what's more powerful is the original experience of who I am. But this does require an investment. You can't meditate once a week and, and then expect to win a battle against your emotions. It doesn't work like that. Because it's an energy game. Right? So you're going to have to find out and experiment how much investment do I need to make in myself daily? You know, morning, evening, how much time that keeps my energy at a certain level um, at which I feel calmer. I can handle things in a calm manner. 
every day. I think that's very important. So I just want to pause there for a moment and maybe just invite you into two minutes of a little meditation before we take up another topic. Okay? So again, just allow yourself to become present. And this time, just visualize yourself drawing a large circle around you. You're in the middle of that circle. And that circle is slightly elevated. So it's like a ring around you that's suspended and it's got lots of hooks on it. And slowly you start to put aspects of your life on each of those hooks and begin the process of emptying yourself, emptying your awareness of the clutter that dominates your awareness. You can hang up all the different roles, mother, wife, friend, partner, business, man, hang them up, your job, I have a job, I'm not my job. You can gently place all the people in your life on that circle. Your house, your possessions. And finally, The last costume, the costume of your body. And as you do so, a lightness takes over. As you come back to the living light, that you are. I am a star, a soft living energy of peaceful light. Allow that light to fill the space in the circle. And enjoy the space of being free. just a few minutes left. I'm just going to fast forward now to um, something else we wanted to touch upon. And that was really the, um, the second step of the journey of meditation. The first step is really the journey inward. The second step we call as the journey upward. And um, sometimes it's said we move from meditation to yoga. And this is called Raja Yoga Meditation. 
And as you may know, the word yoga comes from the Sanskrit word yuja. Yuja means union or connection or link. And really the first step of yoga is uh, bringing together, unifying the energy of my consciousness away from my age, my name, nationality, race, etc. And just bring the energy of my consciousness back to the awareness of I, the eternal self. But then the next step really is then connecting with uh, the big guy the divine source, the divine being, whatever word we use. And, um, and I'm going to ask you maybe to share something also, but you know, what happens when we are in this state of mental yoga with the divine source of love and peace and light? And what happens when we are in yoga? Well, it's like this, that whatever your mind focuses on, whatever your mind connects to, <coughs> you become similar to that. Mm. You, know, you draw the qualities of that into yourself. Uh, for example, you may have seen a, a very old couple who have been married many, many decades. They begin to look like each other. Did you see that? No? Because in the mind of one is the face of the other, and whatever is in your mind also affects your features, your characteristics. Uh, some people look like they're dogs. <laughs> well, they're cats. Have you seen that? Next, next time, please bring a picture of your dogs so we can just check. So it's having dog yoga, having yoga with your dog, and you begin to <laughs> look like the dog. So if we have a yoga with this source of peace, love, power, the Supreme Being, then the sign of that is those qualities would also be charged up within me. So the sign of a yogi, one who does this, is that then in our way of dealing with people, situations, there is greater patience, greater love, the capacity to forgive and so on. And hence it has sometimes been said that yoga is the highest action a human being can do. And the experience of yoga with the divine is uh, the greatest human experience. So, I mean, how do you use that in, um, in your own life? And let's ask you, what's, what's, your, what's your way of having this yoga connection? You know, I was never looking for God. I know it's this big word or this benevolent energy. When it came, it was something that existed and it was an accepted thing in my family growing up. And when I started to become aware that there is a separate energy out there, I guess what was important for me as a first step, and I began to quickly realize, is that for me to build a relationship with anything beyond me, and it's the principle of having a relationship actually, yoga, um, it's less about who and, and it's about how you have the relationship, was the factor of cultivating detachment um, inside. That was quite important. Because I realized that every time I let myself be interrupted by my own doubts and my own interpretations of things and my own judgments of things, my assumptions of things, I would inevitably miss out on seeing how this divine energy had the potential to work in a situation. So I'd be very good at doing something. I'd be extremely accomplished at doing something. I'd have packed something up like this in my head. I'd have analyzed it like this in my head. And I realized that I was carrying certain tendencies of thinking and maybe, you know, being very skilled and talented that were actually not allowing me to experience a partnership. And so you come at a point when you actually realize, you know what, I'm being very, very efficient in my life, but how effective am I? Right, and I know that when, when, especially when you're working with a lot of people, you know, when you're doing something by yourself on a project, easy peasy, administration, you're in charge, you do it. But then when you're leading a team and you're working with 20, 30 people, then you've got to change your strategy. It's not like doing task management, right? You keep telling people what to do, they'll eventually leave you, <laughs> and they'll say, "You go do it yourself." 
And so at some point in my own journey, because a lot of my work has been working with a huge number of people, I realized that, wait a minute, um, how I'm relating here, I've got to change this. How do I do that? And I didn't know how, but the first step for me was suspending my intellect often, the moment I arrived into situations or in a relationship, a lateral relationship first, because I'm a very earth person. So I need to experience the divine here, first of all. I need to just figure out, you know, before I can go beyond what does that look like here. And so I would stop and I would, where before I would have thought about what to do in the situation, how to do it, I would just suspend all of that. And I would listen. I would just listen to the dynamics that are happening. And then very slowly in my mind, I would have this visualization where I'm going to the center of the circle, I'm parking everything that's in this relationship or in this situation out here, and I'm in the middle. And as I'm in the middle, I'm just opening my heart and mind to a supreme light. And then I'm watching to see what happens. It's very, I keep it very simple. Because this is a parental energy I've come to discover over the years. It's a very benevolent energy, but it's very subtle. You know, love is a subtle energy. Yes, it's, an, it's a sensual emotion when you get trapped in the body and you get attached to somebody or something. <laughs> but beyond that, real love is a very subtle energy. And you need to be quite quiet internally to watch how it works. And I've often been quite surprised that when I actually detach and not engage, you know, immediately or react to a situation, amazing things happen. I'll give you an example. Um, I was at a talk, you know, a few months ago, and um, at this particular talk, after you finish a talk, you open up for questions and answers. And there was a gentleman sitting in the, in the corner of the room, and he proceeded to say, yes, I, have, I had something I'd like to say. <coughs> Great, thank you. And then he proceeded to give me a list of all the words that I used in my talk that were not quite accurate. So he said this, it's not like this, and he said that, so he could use this word better, he said that. So I was watching myself, so I, you know, I immediately just put him on the center of, the, I put him on the circle, the circumference, and I go, okay, that's him, he's expressing that, I'm right here. And one minute went by, I was okay, no problem, continue. Two minutes went by, I was okay, continue. The third minute, and I started to feel something. And in that moment, I just stopped, and I just invoked. I just literally, just very simply remembered. Remembered there's a parent that belongs to both of us here. And the moment I did that, that very simple, pure act of remembrance, he stopped talking. It was amazing. Right mid-sentence, he stopped talking. And he looked at me. And he said, is there anything you want to say? And I looked at him and went, thank you. That's a real act of love that somebody to, should take such great care to help me with all the terminology I need to correct, so thank you. And then the rest of the audience proceeded to correct him after that. <laughs> but it's, I'm just saying that because it's in, you know, this is a parent. And when we went into the space in the beginning of this evening, um, imagine that energy multiplied a million fold. It is an ocean of love. It is an ocean of benevolence. It is an ocean of peace. An ocean of silence. And it is coming home. And I know for me in my journey of be it overcoming emotion, uh, releasing pulls, the support of just remembering this divine energy has been important. But the first step has been detachment. The big D. Right? We don't like this word. But in my terminology, really, the practice of detachment is the practice of creating space. Just stepping back. Don't... You know, we, we, we function a lot on autopilot. Right? We have certain mental processes, thinking in place, it's just autopilot. I think like that, I know what to do, dot, 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 dot. And so we end up a great day, but 
my happiness levels haven't increased, my contentment levels haven't increased, I haven't upgraded my software to the next stage. Now, the thing about the mind is it's very used to familiar experiences. That's what it wants. It just wants a familiar experience. It wants to repeat it again and again because it's safety. It's secure. And that's where you have to challenge yourself. You have to step into unfamiliar territory if you want to grow and upgrade your inner operating system. And for that, you have to practice just suspending, walking into a meeting and suspending your opinion first for a change. Right? It's as simple as that. And then watching what happens. That's very, very important. What that does is it breaks the autopilot mechanism that we work on every day that give us the same results again and again and we just the same person because we're doing the same thing again and again. And ten years later, I haven't grown, I haven't shifted, I haven't moved on. So, first step is this act of creating space. And that's, for me, very, very important. That's how I manage many, many things in my life. Um, and as I do that, the space allows me to just remember. And for me, it's very easy to remember a parent that looks like me. You know, I'm not remembering a person, I'm just connecting with an energy. And I find that when I come back to myself and I just carry a thought up, which is as simple as that, um, a connection happens immediately. I can't remember the divine from Gopi. When I'm caught up in Gopi and what Gopi is and what Gopi's doing, the personality of Gopi. So I've got to even create and step back and create space between I and my personality. You know, it's, it's like, just take off a costume for a while, right? An actor doesn't act in every single scene of the play. It has certain shot scenes, so I can just take that off. And I can just be a child, a child of the Supreme. That, for me, is the next step in the connection, is letting myself be a child, yeah? coming back to that place of just being that soft energy of a child and knowing that beyond my own little thinking processes of how something has to be done, there is a bigger energy in play. And that's the energy of the divine and the energy of the bigger sequence of the movement of the drama around us. So I may judge an immediate moment, <coughs> right or wrong or good or bad, but that's my judgment. But that moment exists accurately in the bigger scheme of things. So this connection with the divine requires detachment, the creation of personal space first, so that I can experience company. Yes, there are some things that I can manage with my own spiritual energy when I'm just seated and connected with myself. But there are tougher relationships, especially people I've found in my life when they're tough. I need to stop and I need to do some work to create a space and to be with the divine before I engage. And that preparation protects me a lot. It protects me a lot. And that's very important. It's, it's a small amount of attention, I feel, that's required, which will save you a lot of heartache later. <laughs> yeah, but like I said, you know, meditation is what? It's the act of being more attentive, slowing down and being more attentive with things. I don't have to answer if they're pushing me for an answer. You know, the head of this organization, the administrative head, um, who passed away in 2007 and now is Daddy Janky, but the previous one, she always had a particular set of rules and she would say, 24 hours. She says, nothing is an emergency. 24 hours. Yeah. Somebody would come with her with urgent request, she says, I'll give you an answer in 24 hours. And somehow the way she said it <laughs> and how she acted with it mentally meant that within 24 hours she could come up with a decision that was working. Because it's not about you know, giving everything that's needed right there and then. Oh, well, somebody's asking me for an answer, so I have to give an answer, I have to give an answer. No, why lose myself in that process? If I need some time, I have to say I need some time. 
And so buying yourself space is important. And um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I feel that it's, <laughs> it's connected in the sense that I can't separate my, what I do with the supreme and how I'm interacting here, because that's connected. And I've often found that if I have an issue here, laterally, it's because there's something I'm not receiving from the Supreme. And that's really important. Because the ego only dissolves when it has something higher than it. Pure love dissolves ego, like that. And so the act of being an instrument on the field, yes, a child, and then as I engage on the field as an instrument has been another very important position for me in my connection with the divine. That at the end of the day, you're children of the one, I'm a child of the one. And so more than my opinion and my idea and my belief and my this and my idea, there's an energy flow between us that's much more important. And so that's always kept and sustained. I sense the energy in the room is pretty high. So I think indeed we've had a master class in meditation tonight. Can we show our appreciation please to our speakers? Oh.